right. Okay. We're just going to roll right into the next session for the most part. Yep. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for joining us. Welcome to session three. Um, this is Marin, and I'm joined with Diana, and we're going to give you a brief update on marketing. We also have with us a guest presenter from Razzle Marketing, and she's going to be talking to us a little bit about reputation management and crisis management. Briefly give you a recap on how the website's doing. It's been pretty stable since the last meeting. Health score still remains at 96%. We run a nightly audit, looks at everything from the quality of our content to coding best practices, our SEO, our page speed, which as you can see here is um, still between 93 and 98%, depending on which page you're looking at. But in addition to looking at the quality and the health of the website, we also use it to conduct competitive research and keyword analysis. Um, back in the last meeting, we were tracking approximately 130 keywords. We're now tracking 142. And we base that based off of locations, um, monthly search volume. So it moves quite a bit. Of the keywords we're tracking right now, 97% of them are on page one of search and 74% are in the top three. Um, our bounce rate has ticked up a little bit from last year. It's now at 27%. Uh, last year it was between 26, 26.5%. Um, that's largely because we've, uh, we've expanded the blog considerably. Uh, blog posts tend to have slightly higher bounce rates, but that has not impacted our conversion rate at all. We're still holding at roughly 5.1%, which is what we were doing last year. Traffic is down slightly from last year. It's off about 9%. Um, number of factors contribute to that, one of which is obviously competitive landscape. But we've also sent out fewer email blasts than we did last year at the same time. And we've lost some airports, one of which was San Francisco, and that was a pretty big hit from a traffic standpoint. However, we are doing things to counter that. In the past month alone, we've added two new locations to the Go site. We now have an affiliate in Paris and another one in the Cayman Islands. And both of them offer airport and point-to-point -point transportation, which is a really nice, um, nice one for Go. And I know that Jim Peterson is actively working with um, Go and Hudson to onboard even more affiliates in the near future. Another thing that we're looking at to help increase traffic and conversions is mobile. Um, over 52% of all visitors to the Go site now are using a mobile device of some sort to access um, the content. That's compared to 46% last year. So we obviously are continuing forward with our mobile first approach. And one of the ways in which to do that is to develop accelerated mobile pages or AMP pages. And those AMP pages are given preferential treatment in search. They're great for local and brand searches. They have, tend to have much lower bounce rates, higher engagement rates, and conversion rates. And um, both Google, Yahoo, Bing, and other browsers now support them. We've got some questions coming in. Sorry about that. Um, OK. Um, so far, we have 10 pages built. And the reason why we wanted to do them is Quite frankly, the, the numbers speak for themselves. Our homepage on um, mobile has a 31% bounce rate and a 2.6% conversion rate. That same page in AMP has a 16% bounce rate and a 4% conversion, so marked improvement. We have 10 pages so far, and every single one of the pages we've added is seen a similar trend. So the airport page may have a 28% bounce, but the AMP page has a 13% bounce, or the conversions may have been, in one instance in JFK, a 2% conversion on mobile, but a 5.5% conversion via AMP. So we plan to continue expanding upon this. Um, we're adding them based upon traffic. In March, we'll be looking at Milwaukee, Minneapolis, Punta Cana, Honolulu, and Philadelphia. And it's our hope, by continuing on this mobile-first approach and then onboarding more locations, we'll be able to see a nice uptick in traffic in 2019, along with all the other initiatives that Diana has planned, as well as data point partners. So I'm gonna turn it over to Diana, and she's gonna talk a little bit about sales, and we'll just keep moving forward. Thanks. I'm gonna talk really fast. Um, so basically, uh, JR puts together some very complex and detailed reports, which are awesome, but I can, I'm summing it up in two bullet points, which is basically overall sales, are up 2.8% over 2017. However, our email sales are down slightly, and there's some reasons for this, which Marin just shared. We sent out fewer emails, um, and also our list size has decreased from 550,000 to 489,000. 
So you can see that our total revenue was down somewhat from uh, 2018 versus 2017. Um, and you can see also reservations and revenue are down. And we're, we're gonna share these presentations too, so if you can look at these numbers, I'm just going very quickly. Um, but you can see the reservations with both shared rides and sedans. So we know what works, and that's when we change the offers. So when we first started offering 10% off and triple miles back in August, we saw an increase in, um, and open rates and click-through rates versus the emails. And we usually send two a month, but again, this year we've been sending out some, sending out fewer ones for various reasons. Uh, but when we did the 10% off and triple miles, the visit to the frequent rider page was up by 386% and signups increased by 559%. Um, we offered a $10 rebate recently and um, it helps when we offer discounts available for all services. I will say that customers get frustrated when um, they can only do shared ride, or if they try to book a city and it says that that's one of our cities, I think probably only half of our operators are participating in our Go discounts. And I said building list would help. Um, we've dropped from 550, 550,000 to 489,000. So it would be extremely helpful for all of Go as a group and a brand if more operators would participate and help us build those lists. This last thing we did was getting $10 back. Um, people had people booked online and they were um, once they got their confirmation they were sent to a form that they had to fill out it was for round trip fares only a $50 fare minimum and we just sent that out I think last week if not the week before so we're, so, yeah. yeah so we're still getting numbers in on that uh, so far again they had to book through a special porter portal um, and they do have to take action to get the $10 back so not all of them are doing that so while they are um, people are booking they may or may not be requesting that $10 back. Um, we had an 8.5% open rate. I checked that this morning and that had gone up to 8.9 and the open rate was also 4.9. So we're gonna see that continue to go up. And we've had about 100 requests now. So that number's changed too. Right, so the bookings are probably now over 300. And, oh, I'm sorry, more requests also for uh, More rebates? rebate requests have okay. come in. So we've had yeah. about 100 requests so far for so, the rebate. Right, so these numbers are not complete, but we know that you know we, we tried something new and that's what works. Um, the day after someone completes their trip, we send out a customer satisfaction survey. Uh, it, and you can see that we have a very high open rate on that at 39% and a very high click-through rate. And of the people who click through, 45% book another trip. So we think that's great. You can see the ratings for the most part for Go are really good. They like us, um, they'd use us again, um, they would refer people to Go, they know they can use it for a round trip. They're more likely, about 42% more likely to book using mobile or laptop, that number changes. Um, and as I said earlier, almost 50% have used Go two to five times in the last six months. So that's great, because it shows customer loyalty. Once they use us, they like us, they wanna keep using us. One question that we added, because um, one, I do add comment fields for things we do great, and we do a lot of things great, people comment on that, but one complaint we do get is, it took too long to get picked up, where I was the last person dropped off and I was waiting in the van too long. So we asked them in the survey, would you pay more to be picked up or dropped off first? And out of the responses we have gotten as of Friday, 24% said yes, and 11% of those said, yeah, they'd pay $10 or more. So that's interesting. Um, this might be an opportunity to offer different levels of reservations. Uh, I, don't, I know that um, makes things more complex on the back end, but it may be an opportunity to increase fare prices if for people who are being willing to pay more to get spend less time in the van. As we know, DataPoint Partners use it, uh, manages all our Google AdWords and our affiliate marketing. Um, in summary, you can tell we're growing year over year. We're investing more and we've seen an increase year over year in both sales and in orders. 15% in sales, 13% in orders. Moving forward, uh, keyword expansion, testing non-brad keywords, using more promotions within the ad copy, testing with display ads, and uh, uh, DataPoint's gonna complete a compet competitive analysis to audit the keyword list versus top competitors to uncover uh, keyword gaps that can be added to the account. Affiliate marketing. This is where Go is on third-party pages. We are currently on 317 different websites and continuing to add these. Uh, they're constantly adding to these. And these accounted for 6% of overall sales. It was launched in May 2017. 
And we've seen, an, uh, you can see year over year, once again, we've seen an increase of 14% in orders and 30% in site visits. Moving forward, oh, this is an example of what these look like. So again, they're on third party sites. Um, these are some examples, bond, pl bonds plans, voyage, and free tours by foot. You can see what we're, what we're doing on the sites there. Moving forward, uh, recruiting more publishers, obviously getting more affiliates on, uh, testing with coupons, content publishers, working with existing publishers to get better placement on the sites. And those that have said that they would uh, be on board are inactive in providing test incentives for getting them to place that first link on the quality page and get them more engaged. Social media and content. We send out two press releases per month. One is based on something fun like fun travel gadgets for you know, the holidays or fun things to do in the city. Our next one is gonna be St. Patrick's Day parades, flower shows, you know, new roller coasters in the summer. That's one of the releases we do. The other one is based on a question that we ask in the survey. Um, should pets be allowed on planes? Should people be able to bring food on planes? Our next one is um, what kind of travel perk would you like if you wanted one? And we send those out via press, uh, PR Newswire and directly to news editors. And I track those via reports from PR Newswire. If anyone would like to see those, let me know. And also through Google, um, Google Alerts so I can see where we're being picked up and whether people are just publishing our release or whether people are actually taking the release and maybe rewriting it and, and posting it. And we're getting pretty good pickup, especially within the travel trade. Blog readership is up by 18%. I attributed that to more frequent postings and also um, so many guest, re guest posts that we're getting. I probably get three or four requests every week for people wanting to write guest posts and that's great because they share them across their social network. So again, we're driving traffic to the website. Maybe people aren't booking right away, but they're coming to our site and they're knowing we're there. Overall, Facebook engagement is up. Um, as we know, we've hired a, a relatively new person. She's doing a great job with posting uh, engaging posts, not just, you know, here's what's going on in a city, but really interesting posts. She's also answering complaints on the page, which are being answered uh, more quickly, which is very helpful. Um, make sure you follow us on Instagram. We haven't done a lot with that yet, but we're getting there. And I'm going to announce an operator and employee contest. We know that videos outperform any other post we do. So I need your videos. At this point, Jai is the only one that's sending me videos, but it gets huge response and engagement. So I will send out an email saying, um, send me your videos. And in um, the New Orleans uh, con conference, I'll announce the winner. Whoever gets the most like on their videos is going to get a $100 gift certificate. Um, this is an example of our Going Places blog. You can see the different titles. Um, some of these are blog posts from guests and some of these are from ours. But you know, eight, 10 tricks in Google Maps and great gift ideas for travel lovers, Thanksgiving activities, top eight hacks present jet lag. So we're really doing well in providing content and interesting content. Press releases, we post all the press releases on the, um, under the About page on the Go site. If you wanna go those and you can see exactly, we, again, we send out one to two a month. And again, I track those to see how well they're performing. And that's it for me. We're gonna turn it over to Joanna from Razo Group Marketing because uh, while Marin and I have provided ideas on how to manage your Facebook page and improve those, you've asked for how to do um, social media reputation management and I don't do that and Joanna does, so we brought her in. Okay. So is that fast enough? I know, right? It's like <laughs> speed dating or something. It's unbelievable. Okay. Well, that's, yeah. All right. Okay. Let me just, I'm sure you know that mic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Joanna Pelletier. I am the, um, I am the principal of Razo Marketing. And um, today I'm going to talk to you about um, how to manage uh, your reputation through a disaster situation or just a crisis. So um, today we're just gonna walk through some tools and best practices. I'm sure you're very familiar with this stuff, but um, it's worth going through again. Um, we'll talk about your core crisis team, how to create a cr crisis communications plan, how to craft the right response, and then how to control the message. And afterward, um, we'll take some questions if there is some time. Um, so a little bit about Razo. Um, we are an independent Chicago-based digital marketing agency um, that I founded last year in January. Um, we are pretty much a full service agency. So anything from market research to search engine advertising, um, 
to online contests, sweepstakes, and giveaways, we we offer those services. Um, so, and then just a little bit about me. Um, I am a marketer with over nine years of experience in the industry. I have worked with uh, companies from large to small, including United Airlines and the Discovery Channel. Um, and I really get a kick out of this stuff. Um, so let's go over some tools and best practices here. Um, one thing that I really want you guys to keep in mind as we go through the presentation is that um, people always remember how you make them feel. Um, people are, you know, we're all emotional, no matter like who we are or where we come from. Um, we are um, very sensitive to, you know, how others make us feel and we remember it. Um, if there is some sort of wrongdoing that occurs and we try to replace it with the trinket, like the trinket may um, may soften the blow a little bit, but it's never going to erase what actually happened, and it's never going to um, it's never going to to uh, take away like you know the event. So um, from here, like I want to go into some loyalty builders. Um, so these are the things that can help you avoid. A crisis or you know avoid any malaise. Um, I mean of course you want to make your booking experience seamless. Um, you want to make sure that all of your online profiles have the correct names, um, correct addresses, correct website information, and correct phone numbers. Um, you also want to make sure that your booking process is fast and easy, um, that all your support staff is adequately trained, um, and then all support staff is treated well and recognized for their achievements. Um, it's also beneficial to create a mission statement and communi communications plan. Um, creating a mission, communi sorry, creating a mission statement for each of your online listings and your social media channels can help you understand their purpose. And having a communications plan in place can help you save time and money during normal periods and in times of crisis. Um, having a point person available as well is um, always beneficial too, since you always have a consistent face to, um, you know, to your team. So everybody knows who to turn to at that point. Um, additionally, it's good to monitor your listings and your brand image so that you know how people perceive you as a company. Um, you can use social listening tools to get a sense of that um, so that when something does pop up, you can manage the situation. Um, and there is reputation man management software that you can also leverage. Um, additionally, you'll want to monitor your competitor listings, their social media and their brand image. Um, doing that helps you get a sense of, you know, how you're doing in comparison to them. Um, pardon me. Um, just a little hiccup. Um, so um, paying attention to that kind of feedback, um, the kind of feedback that they're getting from their customers, um, what they're doing well and um, what they could work on helps you improve. Um, and when that's combined with what you learn from the feedback you receive, you can determine how to set your brand apart. Um, the best way to beat them through throughout everything is through trial and error. It's not by knowing like where they stand and where, it's not by knowing like where they stand. It's about like, um, you know, understanding like your position versus theirs. And um, finally, um, providing world-class online customer Apologize. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> it's okay. All we right. have, let me look to see which participant has audio going. Okay. Um, I'm going to mute all again. So I'm going to mute those people who might be on that aren't muted. Um, so I think we should be okay right now. All right. Okay. Apologize for that slight disruption. No worries. 
Okay. Oh, well. Okay. Got it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, <laughs> uh, so providing world class online customer service is also really important. Um, when someone has a, you know, a compliment or a complaint, it's really essential to respond to those reviews quickly. The faster you respond to a review, um, especially in a time where someone leaves you a negative review, um, that can lessen the impact than it would if you, if you waited for a little bit longer to you know, respond. So the longer someone has to think about a, a negative experience, um, is just the long, or it's going to make it difficult for um, you to recover. Um, when you're responding to a negative review, you always want to be polite, professional, and courteous, um, and always express gratitude, um, personalize your messages, um, be clear about your next steps, and keep your line of communication open. Um, you need to also recognize um, where that person is coming from um, and demonstrate empathy. So saying something like, I understand how this might feel could neutralize the situation a little bit more than, um, than invalidating or potentially like not recognizing that person is upset. Um, so let's move into um, the loyalty killers here. All right. So um, things that could kill loyalty are if you incentivize pressure or pay for positive reviews, um, you should never do this. Um, first of all, it's unethical. Um, Asking people to review your company on Google or any online directory doesn't mean you should reward those who do. Um, if you happen to find, or if you happen to find someone doing this, they may very well have regulators coming, um, coming to them and saying, please stop. Um, the other part is if you continue to do um, incentives for asking for reviews. That's something that people are going to expect. So you're setting an expectation. Um, so it should always be organic. Um, the other part is that like the Federal Trade Exam the Federal Trade Commission, for example, always considers positive third party reviews as endorsements. And according to that agency, if there's any form of incentive or compensation or close relationship between an individual giving an endorsement and the business receiving it, it should be made explicit. Um, being reactive in times of crisis is also a little less beneficial. When we react, we don't really think about, um, you know, how things are going to play out um, 15 minutes from now, and then 15 days from now, and then 15 years from now. Um, it's more damaging to be reactive than it is to be proactive. Um, even when you say bad things about your customers, that can come from being reactive in a time of crisis. Um, also ignoring negative reviews or crisis situations, like just saying that they will go away, can also, um, can also kind of kill a brand. Um, minimizing or negating the feelings of a person who left a negative review is also a pretty big no-no. It's kind of a loyalty killer. Um, the reason for that is, um, well, first, um, that person is, you're going to lose a customer there, but also, um, you could potentially lose, um, several other customers as a lot of people look to negative reviews. Um, as a reference, or they look to your resp response to negative reviews as a reference. Um, another thing I would suggest avoid doing is to pay to have negative reviews removed. Um, the first thing you should know is that you can't pay to, or you can't have negative reviews removed from Google just because you don't like them. Um, the caveat to that is that Google and other sites will remove reviews that um, that fall under the categories of being appropriate, threatening, illegal, racist, fake, um, leaving a review for the wrong business, as in 
leaving a review for a steakhouse instead of a digital marketing agency, uh, leaving a negative review for multiple, multiple branches of a business, and also um, if you get a lot of negative reviews as a result of a controversial media incident. Um, feeding the trolls can also work against your favor. Um, if a customer has a legitimate complaint, by all means, take the time to make things right, but some people are out there just to stir up trouble. Um, they may be a competitor in disguise, or they may be per a person having a bad day, or they may just be one of those complainers who is never happy uh, unless anyone, everyone around them is miserable. So the best thing to do is just to um, not feed or encourage them um, because they'll keep coming back long after and they'll be seeking your attention. Um, and finally, don't forget to thank your customers. Always, always, always be gracious um, for them using your service. Um, and then, so one other thing, um, I mentioned earlier that 89% of consumers, or that people look to um, negative reviews and how you respond. That is about 89% of consumers who read through that. So if you're on Yelp and you're looking at a business and you see responses from the business, people are going to look at that. Um, that's kind of their measuring stick for if they want to collaborate with you or not. Um, so if you have negative reviews, the best way to get rid of them is to bury them with an experience that's both rewarding and uh, exceptional for your customer. Um, so, and that's an organic side effect. Um, or sorry, good reviews are an organic side effect of an excellent customer experience. Um, just a few tools. Um, I won't dive too deep into them for the sake of time, but um, these are some of my favorites. So I'm a very big fan of Yext, um, SEM Rush, Rush, Review Push, Go, uh, GoFish Digital, Yapo, Similar Web, Tinai, and um, Google Alerts. Um, Yext is a tool that you can use to monitor across 100 digital services globally. Um, so you get to look at Google, Amazon Alexa, Apple, Bing, Facebook, Yahoo, and Yelp. Um, and then GoFish Digital com uh, Complaint Search, um, that's a tool that you can use to find complaints about your business throughout the digital ecosystem. Yotpo encourages customers to write more positive reviews. Uh, review Push is a review monitoring software that helps you see all your online reviews in the same place. Um, and then Tinai is a reverse image search. So with Tinai, what you can do is you can get an you can get an image, and then you can get its URL, and you can look for um, the places where your image show or where the image shows up in search. Um, and then uh, Similar Web is a free tool that you can use to monitor your competitors. Um, and SEMrush is kind of an all-in-one. It's really more of an SEO-focused tool, but you can also use it for, um, for social and other purposes. In fact, that's actually one of the tools that Hudson uses on behalf of its clients. That's one of our regular tools that we have, and that's how we do our keyword and competitive analysis and know what our competitors are up to and what keywords we want to track, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so let's go through like the core people who should be on your crisis team. Um, spoiler alert, it's not very many people. Um, so on your core crisis team, um, when things blow up, it can become pretty difficult for a single person to manage social media and all the channels that need to be dealt with. Um, it's, it's a lot. Um, so to help everyone navigate through crisis um, as in as smooth, smooth of a fashion as possible and save you money, you'll need a team that with the appropriate expertise. So the people you definitely need are your CEO, your marketing person, um, someone from legal, and another person from PR. So your CEO should be the first person notified of the crisis. And they are either the spokesperson or they have an assigned spokesperson who um, 
who works on the behalf of the company in disastrous times. Um, the marketing team should be managing the customer communications. Um, they should be identifying and measuring the public's attitudes and reactions. They should also be taking the lead in engaging social media and the online communities. Um, so channels like Twitter and um, you know any other channels where there is a live response, um, that it, those are areas where the marketing team will be essential. Um, the legal team, they're more internal facing. They don't really have as much of a relationship with the public. Um, but they're still very essential. So they should also be contacted immediately for their guidance and their counsel in order to avoid any potential or further legal costs. Um, they should not be the person to drive your crisis communication strategy. Um, and then finally, your PR people are in charge of monitoring for potential issues and developing response templates for just a variety of scenarios. So for example, if there were an accident or if one of the vehicles caught on fire or um, you know, potentially worse, they would be the person developing templates to um, respond to the public and also um, handle the relationships with the media. Um, they're also responsible for taking charge of the crisis communication strategy and prepping others in the organization for interviews and press conferences to ensure there, that there is a uniform messaging. So um, hypothetically, if something were to happen, um, there could potentially be a meeting with a PR person um, and they would say, you know, internally, this is how we need to manage the situation as a company. This is our main message, and please, their ask would be to please stick with the same message so that um, it's a little bit easier to, you know, not only just remain uniform, but also to navigate the company through that difficult period. Um, <clears throat> so, next, um, these are the folks who are your additional support. Um, so, um, it may not, it may seem a little unlikely, but your IT or information security people are also a pretty big deal in this scenario. Um, if there is any sort of information security issue, um, such as a customer data breach, um, the chief security officer or the head of IT can provide visibility into the nature of a cyber attack or other instances of unauthorized access and um, create requirements to resolve any vulnerabilities. Um, they also provide PR and marketing folks with speaking points such as like how the security processes and infrastructure safeguards against security threats. Um, and then the other two um, folks are a little bit more interchangeable. So an operations head, for example, um, if a safety issue arri arises within the fleet, then the operations head should provide insight into the cause, its impact on the customers, and a resolution plan. Um, they should also be collaborating with marketing and PR on messaging to ensure the issue is clearly and accurately articulated to customers and the media. Um, and then finally, your key department heads. Um, this is also an internal facing role, much like the other two. Um, they should be prepared to take on any additional responsibilities um, should a crisis strike their department. Uh, the vice president or the head of the department should also provide their team members who interact with the customers specific verbiage to use um, in the effort to stay on message. Uh, so these are just some actions to take before disaster hits or before disaster strikes. Disaster is a little bit of a dramatic word, but I mean, it is what it is. Um, so defining the team roles, um, it's a lot like a fire drill. Um, so you should know who is responsible for what, um, and then you should share that information with the people who are who hold like each specific responsibility. From there, you should be training and testing the team um, 
so that everybody knows what to do, where to go, and what to say when something bad happens. Um, the better you train the team, the better of a chance you have at getting through uh, the worst times of a difficult point. Um, next, you should establish a communication center um, and then also establish support areas for uh, the target audience. Um, next, we should, um, uh, there should be, sorry, you should identify potential scenarios, train and test the team, create communications materials, and then gather the support documents. Um, so really, if you are able to follow all of these things, um, you could potentially save tons of money um, just from potential switching. In fact, about uh, 136.8 billion is lost by US companies um, as a result of customers switching to other companies. Um, so the more you do ahead of time, the better off you are. So let's go through creating a crisis communications plan. Um, regardless of how large you are, you should already have some sort of plan put together on paper if and when disaster strikes. Um, it all boils down to the phrase, proper planning prevents poor, poor results. If you find yourself in the middle of a crisis without a plan, it's going to be more difficult to come out ahead than it would if you didn't have one. Um, your plan should also be a lot like a roadmap for getting through a crisis. Um, as I mentioned earlier, everybody should know what to do, where to go, and what to say. Um, you need to know who's going to be a part of the essential team, um, how you're going to communicate with internal stakeholders, employees, the press, and your customers. And then there should also be checklists available for each crisis team member so they know what actions to take uh, before, during, and after an incident. Um, and really, the best crisis plans are consistent, inclusive, easy to understand, and easy to access. They have the same structure across all sites. They include a broad range of participants during the plan development, i.e. drivers, operators, um, people from the marketing team, people from the IT team, um, pretty much everyone. There should be um, input from all areas, um, just so that um, all your bases are covered and that there is equal representation. Um, and also so that it's easy for everyone at every level to understand. Um, once that is put together, the crisis plan should be placed in an, in an area that's easy for everyone to find. Uh, you know, something that every department has access to that should be taken into consideration. Um, and ultimately, what that plan does is it protects the reputation of the company. Um, the crisis plan should also be able to address the different audiences you interact with on, on, day, on a daily basis. So customers who are unaffected uh, by the change, special interest groups, politicians, um, government agencies, employees, family members, members of the media, pretty much everybody that has some sort of touch point with you should, um, should be considered and addressed. Um, but more importantly, before you do that, you should already have strong trusting relationships between employees and core stakeholders um, before you find yourself in a difficult time or in the middle of an incident. Um, the stronger you are beforehand is going to show when things go when things go sideways. So it's a lot like having an insurance policy for your business, and that trust and credibility is something that's earned over time. So this is just a really quick example of a crisis communications plan. I know it's a little hard to read, um, but it's from the University of Washington. The one thing that I really liked about this particular plan is that it's very clear um, and they shared the, the purpose, the scope, and the objective of the plan. Um, they thoughtfully created detail around training, plan updates, procedures, how they would respond, how they would notify their various audiences, 
And they also show detail in which communication tools would be used, how they would be used, um, how they would communicate through each tool, how they would alert the media, and how they would monitor traditional and social media. And finally, um, they defined what behaviors they would use. So really everything has been well thought of. And um, if you guys are interested in taking a look at the plan, I can share a link to it after the presentation. Um, so here are some things to consider like when, when you're in the middle of an incident. Um, first, you need to take a step back, assess the situation. Next, um, get the facts. Don't jump to any conclusions. And then once you've done all of that, you need to gather the troops. Get everybody together and just you know, share you know, what happened. Um, the CEO should be the first person to know and um, any main stakeholders should be gathered immediately. Um, so it goes from the top all the way on down to um, each of the drivers. Um, Next, you'll want to pull out your crisis plan, activate your crisis communication center, and then activate the media center. So you're there, you're ready to react, and you're ready to address. And then um, let's just go through really quickly to crafting the right response. Um, so it's very important to act quickly, own the situation, convey empathy, and verbally recognize the impact of your misdeed. Um, you also need to focus on the positives, convey empathy, thank your heroes, and tell the truth. Um, because what's going to happen, especially now in 2019, is that everything is going to blow up within seconds, maybe even, um, you know, maybe even minutes. Um, so one perfect example of this, um, which we are all very familiar with, is the United and Dr. Dow uh, situation. Um, in April 2017, uh, Dr. David Dow was pulled off of flight 3411 by airport police. Um, basically, the flight had been overbooked. Pardon? Sarah, we have to, we have to oh, move we, on. We have another presentation right after this. I see. Okay. I'll try to wrap up quickly. Okay. okay. Um, so he had been pulled off the plane um, and there was, I, um, I'll try to summarize a little bit quicker. There was just a huge blow up um, as a result of this. Um, so these are just some of the things that came or, or some examples of things that came around as a result of the incident. Um, everything from people switching United's, uh, or people updating United's logo to uh, parroting the customer service to, you know, to large protests. Um, and that was all rightfully so because the situation could have been handled much better. Um, and these are just a few more examples of, you know, things that came up. Um, so one of the biggest misconceptions um, from this situation is that it was United who did it, but actually it was airport police who were responsible for, um, for the situation as it was. Um, but the way it was handled by Oscar Minos, the CEO of United, that is what really fanned the flames. Um, first of all, it came off as very snarky, um, and it came off as like him not being sorry. So this is not how you want to respond to a crisis disaster or a crisis situation. This is a grace fire. It's not the right way. It's not the right message and it's not the right way to respond. What he should have said is that he had just seen the video and he was also upset and he was going to clear his calendar. Um, and take take steps to resolve the situation. Um, but um, the the issue is that it didn't happen. Um, there was there was a very uh, there was a message that was crafted um, and it was followed through with. And you know because there's already hard evidence, really the only thing you can do in this kind of scenario 
is to demonstrate authenticity and show that you know you're truly sorry um, so you need to say figure out what went wrong what actions were taken who is responsible um, why things went downhill and how it can be prevented it's also important to just take ownership and tell the truth set expectations um, follow up on the expectations you set show empathy and overall just be human um, that could have helped the situation a lot better than what was posted on Twitter. Um, so let's talk about controlling the message. Um, really, actions speak louder than words. Um, so when your words and your actions contradict one another, it really becomes more difficult for people to trust that you're acting in good faith. Um, so from there, it's, uh, again, always important to have a well-defined, well-practiced plan put together. Um, respond immediately, uh, or sorry, always ready to be go, go live and respond immediately. Um, always have full alignment between your corporate and your field staff. Um, earlier I mentioned that people saw through the policy, or that people saw through the policies uh, changed by United and uh, made after the Dr. Dow incident. Um, so people see through things like this because this happens too much for airlines in general. So, you know, it's just, you know, yet another thing, like yet another event that is, um, um, you know, just like another event, like in the pile of events that have already happened. So it doesn't come off as genuine and really the things that, um, these things will keep happening because there is a fundamental disconnect between um, corporate and the boots on the ground. Um, so when the, you have two very different worlds, um, it's very difficult to keep everything together and manage that. Um, so this is where relationships become the most important piece of the puzzle. When familiarity and trust exist within uh, and between different departments, it's easier to build a consistent culture that feels genuine. And genuine messages are a byproduct of that. Um, you always need to handle disasters and crises with dignity and respect for your constituents. Um, and if you're not controlling the message about, someone, about your company, someone else is, um, just as you saw earlier with United. So um, this is actually my last slide. Okay, okay. Yep. So, um, really, I want to reiterate, people always remember how you make them feel. You know, in 2019, we have more in access to information and control over our destinies than ever before, but regardless of how much we advance through our technology, um, this is always going to remain constant as long as we are around. Um, we're emotional beings whose decisions are influenced by our everyday influences and our experiences walk with us. So it's always, it's always important to remember, um, you know, empathy as we, you know, continue to work with our clients. Um, and that's all I have. Okay, yeah, great. thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So much, yeah. Watch out, pleasure. Don't trip on a cord. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, does anybody have any questions? If not, we're gonna roll right into the final session with Gus, and I'm gonna just switch the presentations. Okay. Let's see here. Okay. Okay. I don't see any other questions, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna turn this right over to Gus, and he's gonna get this going. Okay. The floor is yours. Thanks, Mary. Hi, everybody. So I have the privilege of closing this and wrapping this up for everybody. So I'll make it short and sweet. So like that, we have a hard uh, cut off time at 4 p.m. Um, so I'll try to squeeze it so we can have a little bit of Q&A or else I'll just put my email 
on the chat. So like that, everybody can, uh, can send me over the questions if you have any. Okay, so that being said, let's, uh, let's jump right in. On the call, we have also uh, Derek and Sean from, uh, from Hudson. So they'll try to, to accommodate if we have any Q&A at the end of the, of the session. Okay, so basically, um, Hudson, our presentation is based on uh, tools and, uh, and widgets that our software can provide for the Go affiliates and the Go group members to, um, to be able to increase bottom line and also uh, improve on efficiency. Hold on. Okay, cool. So the agenda, to go very quickly, will be um, just informing for people that don't know or are not aware of about Hudson widgets, um, about Hudson tools, specifically on the multi-affiliate because it's already been deployed, the point-to-point, -point, we're gonna touch on that. The API integrations that we have that we can increase uh, revenue, and also a small little update on the tech stack and uh, finalizing with the Q&A. So jumping right in. So one of the things that uh, Hudson uh, has for his uh, clients, uh, one of the widgets, it's basically um, uh, ready to go. So these widgets can really help and reduce the congestion, the congestion of any call center. So basically what, uh, what can be leveraged from that is optimizing resources and even decreasing uh, headcount if in case we don't need those type of calls coming in because of those widgets that automate that process, right? So I'm ready to go. So for those who don't, under, who, who don't know what it is, so basically it's a, uh, it, it's a widget that when a customer arrives at the airport, the system, the Hudson system can automate an SMS that will advise the dispatch that the client is ready to go. So obviously when, how does it physically work? It's basically the client or the customer gets to the airport, takes his luggage, receives the SMS when, the, when his phone is off of uh, airplane mode. And then from that one, he clicks on a page that you see the interface right there. And he just simply clicks on the call to action button, ready to go. And then after that, the dispatch will be able to manage that. And by the time that he re gets to the gate in order to be able to, to leave the airport, uh, the time of, uh, of delay of waiting for the ride is, uh, is decreased. So the benefits are better user experience and reduce the amount of calls for dispatch in order to be able to, to have that client uh, get, his, uh, get his right. One uh, interesting stat that I want also to, to see is that only at, until now, uh, high level, it's 38% of the Go affiliates are using this widget. So there's this, there is a real good opportunity for other affiliates and, and Go members to actually uh, uh, get this widget up and running and it's not, uh, it's not something, and we, it's something that Hudson can do really quickly. So, the other widget that, I, that is following actually is a really good combination of a one-two combo, if, we, if, uh, if I may say. So the other one is, where's my vehicle? So another one is basically how it works is that, again, it's an automated SMS to the customer so he can view where the vehicle is using the Google Maps. So in the sense that if we combine both together, so the user experience really becomes seamless. So it means that you get to the airport, you get an SMS, we can actually integrate it with flight view if you have it enabled or if you have it as a service. So we know when your time or your plane actually lands. So you get your first SMS, you are ready to go. That triggers another one, where's my vehicle? So like that, the customer is always taken care of by the system. So again, it increases the customer satisfaction reduces the customer stress of where do I go? What do I do? Am I gonna get picked up? It reduces the amount of no-shows at the airport or hence the competition of, oh, my ride is not here, I don't know how to go it, so I'll go get a competition example as an Uber. Reduce the amount of calls to dispatching. And another uh, interesting stat is 40% of the Go affiliates are using this widget, so again, there's an opportunity here in order to be able to activate this and have that reduce uh, the burden on the, on the call center and the, and the dispatching calls that you would get. Uh, moving right along, so one of the tools that we have also at Hudson 
inside of the system is that you can utilize in order to be able to increase revenues is yield pricing. So yield pricing is basically you can manage and adjust the pricing based on your availability. So an example very quickly is adjusting a line run. So this could increase and generate more pre-bookings. And I wanted like, I wanted to present this to be light and light and after that just have more questions. So the stats is 20% of the Go affiliates right now are using are uh, utilizing this widget or tool. So again, a great opportunity in order to be able to increase revenue opportunities right there. Another tool that we have is called Flash Sale. So this is basically you can set up a coupon and enter that code when you are in the shopping cart process. It's very configurable and flexible tool. So it means that that coupon, you can generate it from a starting date to an end date. You can put it on a specific, a specific line or, um, or X, Y, Z. And the benefits again, is that you can get new customers booking, increase opportunity of current customers, and it's a great advertising tool. So basically that combined with a good marketing strategy, you can always provide a flash sale for existing clients or get new clients in order to be able to, to, uh, to increase revenue. 20% of the Go affiliates are using this widget. Another one that also actually is, um, is something that we can configure and all of these tools, um, I just wanna make up a comment. It's really easy to implement and configure by the Hudson team. Uh, meaning Sean and uh, and the rest of the uh, of the crew, so it's not something that is really cumbersome or very exhaustive to in order to be able to implement. So the quick pay tool, um, this actually allows for a credit card once you're inside of the vehicle. So again, it can be sent via an SMS to a customer that has a booking set to pay cash. So for all those bookings that you that a, that a customer has said, I'm going to pay cash once I get to, the, to, the, to my reservation or to my, uh, to my vehicle, this quick pay reduces the cash transactions from the system and it reduces the driver's money manipulation. So basically, I think it's better in order to be able to have also an increased driver gratuity uh, system for better driver retention because uh, it's based on data that uh, a credit card payment is easier to, to leave something to the driver. And after that, the driver is more uh, sticky to your, to your company, right? Because uh, the drivers are, are, are satisfied. One of the things also that, uh, that we wanted to, to uh, inform uh, for the Go affiliates is basically we have deployed uh, for, and most of you already know this, the multi-affiliate uh, module. That one is the one who's actually being migrating from the, the web form that we, that we already have. But not, not of all of you uh, on the Go affiliates are actually util utilizing the benefits of point to point. So again, some of you uh, don't require it and some of you, but at least we wanted to inform what are the benefits of the point-to-point -point in a very seamless and clean way. So point-to-point -point is basically extending the offer of just airport bookings from a start and an end point. Timeline, how long does it take for Hudson to actually integrate this? So it would be a very standard configuration. It is two or three weeks and it doesn't have to be complex. There is a way of just setting up a point-to-point -point based on pure mileage configuration. So that it will be something very easy to integrate and then you can actually increase revenue because you extend the type of uh, bookings that you, that you can provide to your customers. The process is defining basically the pricing for the point to point and then Hudson's team to configure the locations inside of the system. The budget, uh, it's a standard point to point configuration based on the mileage that I just uh, uh, informed. So it's anywhere from about $100 to in order to configure it. So this really gives you an overview super fast of what can we extend on the multi-affiliate integration that we are already having with the affiliates and the Go Group uh, site that is already 
is use, utilizing the multi-affiliate uh, module already. We also have a lot of API integrations. These are three that we thought are, are really, um, that we are integrating on a month-to-month -month basis for a lot of uh, Go affiliates and uh, clients. So we have Grid. So how does it work? Is a uh, Grid is basically an affiliate network two ways. So you'll be able to receive and push reservations with other affiliates that are part of the Grid uh, network. So uh, benefits is uh, increased bookings. Deem and Groundspan are very similar. So basically these are uh, API integrations in order to be able to go get corporate clients that use that uh, API or that service in order to book reservations. So example, it would be a MasterCard corporate client or an Amex corporate client. So it increases revenues by going getting larger accounts for your company. So basically, um, those are the things that I wanted to address. Uh, so um, to, in order to be able to, to, to move fast on that, so I wanted to, to manage time. I wanted to update also uh, our clients on the tech update. So in December, the ones who joined us, uh, we, were, we were developing and uh, we finalized the affiliate driver app. So now it is. Again, uh, pun, no pun intended on, 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 the, on the terminology, but now it's really ready to go. And one of the, we already have three clients that are using it. Uh, people were using it for the Super Bowl uh, weekend and it went really smooth. And now we actually have in the pipeline, four clients, two affiliates, of the Go members that are inside of uh, being up and running with it. So we wanted to at least inform you that it, is, that it is something that uh, we promised, we delivered, and we wanted to inf update you on, on the technology uh, standpoint that, uh, that Hudson is, is moving forward with. So we are now ready, if in case you guys have uh, any questions. I really wanted to, to move very fast on the presentation in order to be able to have a little bit of, a, of time. But at the same time, I wanna respect uh, the time of everybody. And I know we had a hard uh, deadline of uh, 4 p.m. So if in case you need me to extend a little bit more on the widgets that we talked about uh, or the tools, uh, feel free to chat or uh, put yourself off of mute and uh, ask your questions or else, I can simply put in my email and then uh, you, can, uh, you can contact me. How do I type my email? Uh, oh, for the chat? the chat window. Oh, maybe you can do it from my computer. Do you have questions for me? Because I don't yeah. see the yeah, chat. Yeah, we don't see the chat one. Um, I mean, I, I think I have it here. Okay, yeah, hold on. Uh, to all. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Until now, I don't see anything. I don't see any questions right now. I have a question. I don't know. So the question would be the $500 budget on the um, point to point. On the MA7? So yes. What does that include? And so some of the operators had a problem trying to get that mapping together on the point to point. Yeah. And so that would take care of that? Correct. Because we, what we challenged itself at uh, Hudson was how can we make it easier and less um, demanding from the affiliate? So basically, one of the, uh, of the things that Derek and Sean came up with was to configure something based on mileage. So if we configure pricing based on mileage, it reduces the amount of configuration and we can actually leverage that and deploy the point to point on an easier and faster way. Because or else the point to point can really become more of a case by case per company saying, 
it, it's all about the fair files and the pricing configuration that can be very simple or very complex based on what uh, the rules of the company. If we go with a mileage pricing, it reduces a lot the configuration and the time that uh, the team needs to develop it or configure it. So the $500 is only specific to mileage-based pricing? That is correct. Okay. And then I think it's something that uh, can still be uh, a good revenue stream and increase uh, opportunities for the Go affiliates. Okay. Another question. How much is the cost for the affiliate app? How much is the cost for the, for the multi, the, how like the, to, to develop the multi affiliate? No, no, no. How much does it cost for the driver affiliate app that just launched in, um, that we just took in the Super Bowl? The oh, so that is actually something that we wanted to, to have in the roadmap for the Hudson. So it's basically, it's just the configuration part that we need to, to develop. So that I have to reach out to Sean, but I don't think th that's something that Hudson really wanted to, to provide to the clients. So I'm not gonna say it is free, but it's minimal as a cost if it's not already inside of the roadmap. So there's no, for me, from my standpoint, it's something that we wanted to provide and update our clients with it, the affiliate drivers. Uh, app. Okay. Any other questions? Chat them in. Now this affiliate driver app then would replace uh, what we, or the VMDT, would it replace the VMDT? No, the VMDT and uh, the VMDT is basically for the drivers. The affiliate driver app is when you want to like farm out work for uh, drivers that are not inside of your own uh, company payroll. So if you were going to do work with Windy City, you would use this app, for example, and be able to manage and monitor that. Where the pay would be back and forth with Windy City. It was the, the company. So you're not dealing directly with the driver, you're dealing like with a company that this is a driver of that company? And it, that is correct. And after that, you can manage that from a customer service standpoint in order to be able to see how was the ride. And you be able to manage for the drivers uh, in order to be able to retain that client satisfaction because it is your customer that you are uh, sending over to the driver affiliate. So you're farming out to another company, but the customer can have the same experience as the driver has this app. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Would you, uh, would you in the future uh, match the same interface as the affiliate app with the VMBT? Is there anything coming soon to update the driver app for the VMBT portion? You mean to make it more like a Appealing or sexy, let's say? Well, well, well no, this is beyond the aesthetics. Uh, this would be less steps and less training. Oh, we are, yes. That's something that uh, in the roadmap that we want, we want to we wanna provide the VMDT uh, a better user experience. And more automated. That's what we're really Correct. Doing. And that is something in the roadmap that we have, uh, something that, like, you're beating me to the punch, but it's something sure. that we want. <laughs> it's something that we want to, like, like put, in, put in play in the next couple of months. Uh, with Derek, our VP of technology, and uh, and get something really fresh and new for the for that VMDT app for our clients. Looking forward to it. Yes, us us too, <laughs> us too. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, I'm going to turn it back over to John. Thank you very much, everybody, for your well, for your time. You and I really want to thank all the presenters and. Um, Really uh, appreciate all the work in preparing uh, to make this happen. And we had a good um, participation from the Go members. We had a lot of people uh, link in, and, um, and there was good dialogue and, and uh, a lot of presentations. So uh, we wish you well. I want to, everybody to book for the meeting in New Orleans in May. I think it'll be very interesting. And we'll, as Simi uh, promises, to update us on the uh, auto dispatch. and. Uh, we'll learn a lot more about about that and how, how it's working and uh, other things that are, are just going on. Just send a recap. Pardon? Just send a recap with a link. Okay, so it will send a recap of this webinar mm -hmm. with a, a link. link so that you can share that. And then we'd also appreciate feedback um, and thoughts regarding the webinar um, and how, it, you know, what, what we can do to improve it. I know this year it went better as far as people being able to um, uh, jump on last year that was a big problem 
and uh, we had a better problem, you know, control with the muting on it. So a lot of improvements. But um, thank you all, and um, spring will be here. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you again.